Thank you so much for having me and for having this incredibly creative, interesting program. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to be updating my book in a way that sadly gives Siberians a little less agency. I'm afraid that the theme for today is not only indigenous Siberians in the context of war, Ukraine war, Russia's aggression in Ukraine, but also thwarted indigeneity and thwarted sovereignty in three republics, especially of Russia's Far East. These are the republics where I've done most of my field work and where uh, people I've been working with in the diaspora come from. But first, I, and I hope for this audience, uh, probably very familiarly, the official so-called Federation of Russia and its neighbors. Um, uh, this particular version of Russia has the three republics pretty prominently in purple. The Saha Republic uh, is the size of undisputed India. Many people don't realize it. They've traditionally called it Yakutia in the Soviet period and pre-Soviet. Uh, but their own name for their own republic is Saha, and their name for themselves. Um, Buryatia also, and let me get back to that other map, is uh, in purple and around Lake Baikal. It has been quite, I like to use the American political term gerrymandered. Um, it's a lot smaller than the uh, greater Buryatia homeland that Buryats think of. Uh, when they consider their own territory. And two satellite regions have actually been abolished by uh, referenda in the Putin period. Uh, we've got, um, in addition to that, Pliva, uh, also known as Tuva, um, and on the Mongolian border, both Buryatia and, and Tuva. Uh, now, getting to the indigenous peoples, there's already an interesting problem of definition. This chart gives us, and map, uh, a sense of the Russian definition of the smaller peoples with populations under 50,000. Uh, and they're actually about uh, 42 different people. This particular chart has 40 on it. And then, uh, in addition to that, this chart gives the larger indigenous peoples, those with their own republics, who are in the north or Siberia, the far, far east. Um, and they are uh, those over 50,000. And by UN definitions, that is an indigenous people. They don't have their own independent state. This is a cover of my book, which you just saw. And I'm, I'm using it as a way to show you that there really was, especially in these republics, a sense, not quite of statehood, but of, of a homeland territory that had its own accompanying flag, seals, um, symbolism and sense of identity. Once you have borders of a republic, even if you don't have a whole lot of power and it's been very zigzag in terms of the relationship with Moscow, nonetheless, you do have a sense of identity. It's begun to evolve over time. And here the Saha picked a petroglyph with a horse and rider and a flag. Uh, Zivans picked uh, a horseman riding off into the east, although in the Soviet period, this seal was literally flipped. <laughs> so it could face Moscow. Um, the Buryats picked a, uh, a seal that had Buddhist iconography, even though instructions from Moscow said, no, you're not supposed to have religious identity inside of these seals. So there was a kind of interesting assertion of self by the time the Soviet Union collapsed and republics inside of Russia began to feel their own sense of sovereignty and identity. And I watched that process. I was very privileged to, to, to be there during the time when these kinds of cultural and political revitalizations were really coming to fruition inside of the 90s. 
But let's get to the war. This is a very difficult and painful slide to unpack. What I need to explain here, hmm, somebody sell, uh, is the issue of confusing Siberian groups with each other, of propaganda coming from Moscow about the war that makes Siberians the poster children for possible atrocities. They are even more violent potentially than those unruly Chechens. And there's a sense that uh, they're really kind of mix and match expendable. This is the argument some Siberians are making that say that, you know, they're just being made into cannon fire. And I'm taking their arguments very seriously because there has been an enormous disproportionate mobilization of Siberians um, into the war. Um, if we, you look closely at this slide, the thing is it was never taken, of course not, in Bucha, that's ridiculous. But it was taken on Red Army Day or some anniversary of Army Day um, a, a few years back. Um, probably somewhere in the Far East, maybe not even in Saha. They're holding the Saha flag. So these are Saha, not Boreats to begin with. Um, I could say more about this slide, but you begin to get the idea. The Siberians are incredibly resentful that they have become the sort of face of war and of the atrocities. Um, there's no evidence for this. And not only that, Siberians themselves are starting to use the G word, genocide, in the ways in which the war has impacted them. Um, I'm not sure that I'm ready to use the word genocide, but I'd say the effects of the war and the disproportionate mortality has been such that the war seems to be genocidal. Protest. Why aren't people in Russia protesting? So much has been said about this from the West without understanding, one, how repressive the society is, but two, that there have been some protests. It may not be that great. Um, the uh, poster for this talk had a picture of the same protests that I'm showing here. And very soon after this photograph was taken, these women burst into a poetic chant dance, which is called a hohai. And it was um, with the words of anti-war protest. They were immediately arrested. I'm not showing you the scenes, but it's available on the internet of them being hauled off to, to, um, to jail. And they have also been traced there by, by facial recognition for who they are and by internet um, sleuthing on the part of the authorities. And so um, many of the women who were in this protest have gotten in serious trouble. It's obviously putting a huge chill as other protests around Russia against the war have um, on people's ability to really make a statement, but it's certainly been attempted. And here is a map that really is a killer. Um, it is one that's probably underestimated, but done very responsibly with what we know to be the casualty rates that have been reported. And you can see Tuva, Tuva and Boriatia are in black over here. The numbers of people from those regions that have been killed in the war are so much greater per 100,000 than Moscow, which as you see is bright blue. Now you can get a little bit into my field work and some of the ways in which I started learning about uh, indigenous people from the ground up. And what I wanna really say, first of all, is that I am not speaking for any Siberian natives. Um, I am talking to you about my own field work, my own interviews, my own long, long term with many return trips work in these republics and also with diaspora communities here. Uh, the music you heard when, when you first came in was um, music from my study in uh, house 
near here in the Washington area. Uh, one of the things that is um, important to say, though, is that I started learning from all of these activities way back in 85, 86, when I was on the cultural exchange, that Siberians were not in the same kind of position as other citizens of the Russian Federation. That racism did exist, that problems were under the surface. Um, so this nice looking ice rink just outside the university is a shot of a scene with children playing but just a few days before that there had been a brawl on the same spot with russian um presumably so they said soldiers actually beating up university students uh it was the beginning of gorby's perestroika and it was my wake-up call as well because what happened is that the um uh, the students protested what had been unfair arrests of students rather than of people who had presumably um, uh, perpetrated the brawl. I don't want to go into too many details here, but one of the things that this revealed was the degree of underlying tensions that had been really why a lot of people had tried to keep me out of what was called then Yakutia. Um, and uh, here's uh, what happened uh, uh, very soon after the May Day Parade with the university marching down uh, Lenin Prospect. But just before that, the students had marched down Lenin Prospect and demanded to see the chief of police because they wanted Perry Stroika to come to Yakutia. Um, some of the students were kicked out. Uh, this is a very different scene. This is a banner for those of you who recognize and know Russian. Um, greetings hail to the brotherly friendship of the peoples of the USSR. Um, I was taking this shot from just under a big Lenin statue in Lenin Square of the main capital of, of Yakutsk, where I had been sort of ordered to appear and be on the, on the podium. Um, I was very nearly kicked out, incidentally, at that time as an outside agitator, but uh, people realized I hadn't been. And even if I had known some of the students who protested, I had not organized it. So cooler heads prevailed, and I was allowed to start going into the villages. This is one of the other reasons why they didn't want me to see what was going on, the poverty of this region. I and mean, it's still impoverished, even though it has huge resources, as we'll get to. Um, but at the time, and some of these buildings have probably been knocked down and now are, are, are high rises, but at the time people were getting um, water from pumps in the winter. And another point that I want to make really quickly is that a lot of places in all three of these republics are um, not conforming to the stereotype of really great differences, urban and rural, as if you just cut yourself off completely from your home community once you get to, to, to the city. And I think a point that a lot of, of, of uh, people don't realize is the degree to which people go back and forth in a lot of these communities. Um, in this particular shot, the actual mayor of the town of Kalima, um, who I knew, had gone home to help his mother with the haying in, in, um, in the summer. I'm now going to turn quickly to some of the issues of, of press freedoms and of ideals that had um, really been coming to the fore as, as the Soviet Union did break up and as people inside of Saha Republic started to really feel their own power. Um, one of the things that um, was going on is uh, muckraking journalism. This particular guy is a journalist who is known for troubleshooting and exposing corruption among the elites. And he actually told me, this is part of the theme of galvanizing nostalgia, question mark, that he really probably should have lived in another age. Well, these days, his own um, alternative news internet site has been closed and certainly monitored. He's gotten himself in trouble. And this idea that you could 
romanticize the epics is now sounding a little bit strange compared to the tensions about whether one should or shouldn't support the war. We can get into the dis distinction of uh, you know what kind of patriotism you're talking about but in a lot of these communities there is enormous infighting the reason we're trying to figure out whether the population is you know over 50 percent pro Putin is because it's plausible either way so many people are arguing um, that indeed the war is not for them, it's not their war. Um, Wuhan is certainly one of those people. Incidentally, that's a pseudonym. He calls himself Wuhan, which means the great in Saha. Usually you're not supposed to quite do that with your pseudonyms, but he's not modest. Um, in the, uh, the 90s, the issues of of revitalization, spirituality were also really great. And one of the things I was doing was 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 studying the kind of exuberant opening up to ecology and to ecology movements in the sense of homeland. So this slide sort of stands in for that. There was a, a, a 10 session uh, a set of therapies called laughter therapy that played on a lot of different kinds of psychologies. And um, they were chanting, we are in and with this land. They take their homeland seriously, the ecology and the connection to it. And they're also doing something else more urban, and that is their own version of a temple. And incidentally, the local Orthodox um, archbishop was extremely upset because the plans for this particular house of purification called the Archidiete had the steeple for them. It's kind of a, a, a teepee on steroids and a lot of different facets. It's gorgeous inside. He was upset because the steeple was going to be higher than his local Orthodox church just down the street. Summer solstice, you can imagine how important the summer solstice is for Siberian peoples, especially those whose territory extends into the Arctic Circle and beyond. So this is the Minister of Culture inaugurating a new uh, horse hitching post at the site outside of the main capital, Yakutsk, where summer festivals go on all the time. And these are amazingly exuberant. Um, here, he's uh, looking a little like a British colonial himself with a pit and a passing some beautiful um, Siberian music and a white shaman doing the honors in the opening ceremony. These were the days in the 90s when, um, when uh, Saha Republic was just bursting with creative ideas. Um, and when a president needed to be honoring those ideas and that culture. One of the things that I think gets so lost in the shuffle in this day of today, where there are so many yes people, yes men especially in, in power, is that the first president of the Saha Republic after the Soviet Union collapsed um, Nikolaev here in the suit, not in the traditional dress, uh, he's secure enough to be in the suit, um, was enormously popular. He wasn't just populist, he was popular. And it was not a, a kind of grandstanding Hanate kind of a situation. It was a situation where people really felt they had elected uh, their own leader. The, the one in the, the uh, the Saha dress is actually a diamond magnet, and he was a lot less popular. Uh, and that's Shtirov. And then the third president of the Republic had enormous pomp and circumstances. This is already in the Putin period, um, when there's the symbolism of the Saha sovereignty. And it even looks a little bit like a boyar kind of situation. He's about to be crowned with his fur hat. But he was losing power and, and very, very much beholden to Moscow by this time. I'm not even showing you the current uh, yes man president, but I'm going straight to the picture of what is basically the second most uh, huge and devastating open pit mine of diamonds in the world, Mirny. Um, it's been tapped out, but there are lots of others. There is an enormous amount of pollution associated with the diamond processing. And the whole Saha Republic and its ability in the Yeltsin period to negotiate 
uh, its own way, hinged a lot, maybe too much, on the diamond negotiations and the creation of the company Al Rasa, which has now been basically taken out of Saha hands. And certainly the 30% negotiated with the bilateral treaty is no longer the case. Incidentally, that 30% is a disputed figure, but it includes a lot of back and secret parts of that deal. Um, protests again. They've been on and off over ecology, over the diamond industry, over uh, Saha claims that they have the entire Mendeleev table, which is uh, very nearly correct. The resources are phenomenal in this territory. Um, the protests have been mostly ecology oriented, but not all. There were in 21 Navalny demonstrations, and then the women's Sahoja I already mentioned. So many Siberians are kind of accused of being not, um, not aware enough of climate change, which I find extraordinarily inaccurate. They are on the front lines of climate change and very much know that each year there've been increased flooding. This is just a slide to demonstrate that. Enormous amounts of fire, uh, that is burning out of control almost every year in the last few years. I fear for the fire season this year, but this was two years ago. And one of the things that Saha have been particularly resentful of is that they weren't given enough of their um, aid in the fire emergency coming from Moscow in the way that they used to have. Um, so there's just this burning resentment, if you will. Um, I'm leaving Saha now with one more shot. Uh, this is the Lena Cliffs, a World Heritage Site, a very sacred area that um, that has become uh, UN recognized. But for the Saha, their whole territory is sacred as is for the Boreat Lake Baikal. Um, in this particular shot, you see a lot of the enormous um, chateau, the beautiful uh, houses of the mini garks, the issues of who owns these houses, Russian wealthy business people, some Boreat, some Chinese. You see a Russian Orthodox chapel in the background. This is the area of the western side near Irkutsk. And this is kind of a cheap shot, but the eastern side with the Buryat villages is a lot more poverty struck. Um, there is in the current president a great deal of understanding that the people are Buddhist. Um, this is a greeting in um, both Buryat and Russian on the Lunar New Year of 2021, when he was in traditional dress and recognizing Buddhist tradition. And yet Buddhist traditions have been um, kind of perverted as he sends people off to war. Some of the major uh, problems that Buryat have, I've already hinted at, and that is the land amalgamations into neighboring territories, the gerrymandering, the changing of the dimensions of Buryatia so that it is a lot smaller. People in Buryatia have had less ability to protest. Protests have been far far smaller than they were, for instance, in Saha. There's a real difference in the way in which the culture of politics and um, speech, I don't want to say freedom of speech, has played out in Buryatia. And yet here too, there have been demonstrations. And one of the main ones was the pipeline uh, that was planned for around Lake Baikal, which uh, was so much protested that it was actually moved farther north and ended up um, uh, impacting uh, Lena River instead of instead of Baikal. Um, language protests have also been incredibly important. And since 2017, when the entire country changed its educational policies about language, 
Russian has become far more important in the republics and there's been an enormous amount of resentment. The three republics I work in have really been uh, exemplars of the pain and of, of the anger over the Russification project in the Ministry of Education. Here's a Buryat anti-war poster that's very, very new. It's in Buryat. Um, uh, one of the people at the Free Nations Forum that's been going on in Washington the last few days said that the Buryat language is actually in the Red Book now, officially in the United Nations. I'm not sure I haven't checked that, but they are in trouble in terms of the way that the Buryat language has been able to be used in public spaces. But here, a poster, anti-war Buddhist iconography, um, certainly using Buryat language. And this is a kind of stand-in. I don't have time to go into the politics of the incredibly important Ivolga monastery that's in Buryat territory. But the Supreme Lama of Russia is Burya, Damba Orshev, and he has been pro-war. Lately, he has been um, on board, as all the official religious authorities in Russia have been, um, doing the propaganda bidding of the Putin regime so that people are feeling that the values of Buddhism have been subverted there's a good deal of, of, of protest and not entirely underground and certainly online about this. Um, there's been a shamanic revival in Buryati as well. And to some degree, it's been quite permitted to flourish. Um, and this slide actually gives you a tiny little sense, not only of the beauty of the place and of, of the exuberance of some of the ceremonies, but um, the woman, with the drum in the corner um, on your right is Mongolic, Mongolian herself. And she's an apprentice to Buryat Shaman. So she's actually uh, become part of what has been an enormously flourishing cultural interrelationship with Mongolia. And here, this is more of that same ceremony where people are appealing to, um, to a shaman who, who's been spiritually occupied. So they're asking the spirit inside the man on the right um, for advice. Animal sacrifice is part of this. I hope I'm not offending anyone. My last slide from Boryatia is the beautiful sacred island in the middle of Lake Baikal. Um, and this is uh, Olkhan Island where there's a cave uh, and a kind of competition over various religious symbolisms. There's been an icon of St. Nicholas that keeps disappearing from that cave. Now I'm turning to uh, uh, Tuva as uh, we get into our last republic, so we'll have time for questions. Um, and this slide is to celebrate something the Putin administration has absolutely loved to do. Um, this is a celebration of the symbolic peaceful accession to Russia, the 100th anniversary. This is made up history <laughs> because Suva actually was independent um, within this time frame in, in the um, interwar period, or at least uh, had its own state and was a client state, probably more of of Mongolia than of Russia. But never mind that, they are celebrating the 100th anniversary in 2014 with the head of the Republic at the time, with the then just recently appointed Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. Um, you recognize um, Vladimir Vladimirovich and the current uh, uh, Tuvan head, who is now uh, Vladislav Kovalev, has been very much. Um, towing the line uh, of Moscow's war and has been uh, encouraging young impoverished Tuvans to go to war. And the poverty indicators in Tliva have been so great. It's probably you know, way at the bottom of all of the regions of Russia in terms of per capita impoverishment. So the reasons for volunteering for war 
for the army are enormous. Um, here's Shoigu um, at a um, Buddhist monastery complex. Uh, he had recently, at the time this was taken, also been seen at Easter in the Orthodox Church in Moscow. And he's one of these guys who just exemplifies uh, multiple identities, situational identity. He, 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 he lands on his feet and he, he, he does what's needed. His friendship with Putin is famous. Um, I'm not showing you the slide of Putin on a horse with um, uh, 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 no shirt on, but that comes from Tuva. Uh, and here's an, another different take on the history of Tuva, a very different take. Coming from the historian Kadir Ul Bil who was when the Soviet Union broke up, one of the top leaders in Tuva, who was part of a party actually called the Free Tuva Party. Uh, it's called Hastub Tuva. Um, in 1990, he was uh, one of the kind of so called young Turks. I mean, he was somebody who was flirting with the possibility of secession. But instead of that, in his um, exuberant youth, he also became a politician who became the head of the local parliament. So he's one of these exceptional leaders who actually uh, modified his more uh, radical stances. When I interviewed him, uh, he actually said that he had never really been for secession. Um, but uh, in his office, he's looking at uh, the Dalai Lama, um, photograph of Putin is sort of half covered. Um, he's one of the people who has foregrounded the history of Tuva um, before uh, the Soviet Union accession into what was only an oblast, not even a republic. Tuva didn't become a republic inside of Russia until 1961. They had their own stamps. They had their own money. They, um, they had been an independent or semi-independent state. Um, and when the Soviet Union broke up, uh, this kind of history was recognized again. It was advertised and empowering. And it was also the case that the Thibans were already way over three quarters of their own population. And they were in a position, especially as the Soviet Union broke up and the beginnings of a Republic of Tuva were starting to take hold, they, they, they were in a position to say, now, wait a minute, do we really need these Russians? There were actually um, riots against Russians in the early post-Soviet period. This is one of these little details of history that has been kind of tamped down and not that many people remember, but this is part of the background that has created um, some very different politics and sense of identity inside of, of Tiva. This is a slide that indicates, uh, you know, young people hanging out in the evening of white nights, restless youth, unemployment, rampant through the 90s into the Putin period. Um, and now poverty, as I've already said, driving war volunteers. But also on that same uh, riverbank, the NSA riverbank, drew the slide in partly for Marlene, um, Eurasian romanticism has been very rampant in this part of the world. Tevin's thinking in terms of their connections throughout Eurasia and with Central Asia. I'm particularly fascinated by this sculpture because it's a Borea artist who was invited to do this sculpture on the bank of, of, of the Yenisei. And again, Buddhism. Buddhism has been flourishing in Tiva with returned lamas who'd been trained in India. And not only in the Dalai Lama's community, but in other Indian uh, communities. Uh, and they've, given back a sense of, uh, of, of Buddhist identity to Thievan villagers and uh, urban 
here's on the outskirts of the capital of Kazil, um, a fairly new Buddhist shrine. And this one, the Dalai Lama was able to actually uh, consecrate. A lot of people when I was there were saying, why can't the Dalai Lama come back? He's not been allowed to come back to Russia for a number of years since the Putin administration. Um, here we have uh, humble lamas as the heads of, uh, of Tivan Buddhism. Um, this is the sixth humble lama whose politics were absolutely fascinating combinations of ecology activism, of spiritual revitalization, and Tivan identity empowerment. Um, he's got a, a cell phone under his cape, um, an assistant with sports clothes on. But a lot of the, uh, the, the Khamba Lamas have, there's, we're already up to nine now, just in a few years, have, have been influenced by politics, either kicked out or died of COVID. And so now we have a kind of yes person, ninth Khamba Lama. The scholar who also helped reorient people back to their shamanic roots is Kenan Lapsam. He just passed away this year, a great hero for many Tivans. And he helped his protege, Aichirek, which means spirit heart, create a healing center in the center of Fazil. So here you see a kind of the march of the apartment buildings coming into more traditional uh, shrines and, and, and rocks. And now I'm moving into another, out of Tiva into another realm, just very, very briefly to say that one of the spiritual political figureheads of the last few years has been a guy named Shaman Alexander. I've, I've written a lot about this. I'm not going to stop on this today, but he is now in a psychiatric prison for his politics, he wanted to exorcise that demon in the Kremlin, as he put it, and march on the Kremlin and purify with a ritual in Red Square. Well, as you can imagine, this did not work out very well. And unfortunately, he's become um, the poster person for the revitalization of imprisonment for political reasons of people into psychiatric hospitals. So where are we at the end of this? we should just do a few very basic themes. What we've been seeing is a lot of redefining of federalism. Something of a structure of nested sovereignty that has also got the potential for some separatism. Mostly Siberians are like many other indigenous peoples throughout the world talking about basic human dignity, nothing about us without us. We wanna be in on development decisions. But even just with these three cases of the republics, there's an enormous amount of diversity. There's enormous historical contingency. Nothing was inevitable, not about pogroms against Russians, not about any kind of uh, secession, but legacies matter and polarization is serious. Federalism often means something very different in Moscow and the regions. Pragmatic republic leaders have emerged by necessity and they are now today indeed. The only way you can be in power is to be yes. I haven't done much with theory here today, but uh, one of the people who I respect is the um, Indian American theorist, historian of China, Prasenjin Duara. And he has theories about hard and soft boundaries. And once you have soft, good, relatively brotherly inter-ethnic relations harden and turn into polarization, it's extremely hard to get it back. So the point being that after the war, after what's happened, after the polarization we've been witnessing, we are in a very fragile society situation. So many Russians that I've talked to, including good liberal Russians from Moscow, outside of Moscow, think of a kind of nationalism coming out of the republics as very dangerous ethnic entrepreneur discourse. But ethnic entrepreneur discourse does not exist in a vacuum. A lot of polarization starts with Moscow politics. 
Conditions feed resonance. Losing sovereignty especially triggers polarization. All of these peoples have lost sovereignty. Boundaries matter and can be extraordinarily disputed. Obviously, we've seen that with the Buryatia situation. We've seen that with Tiva, which incidentally, as a once independent state on Mongolia's border, was a lot bigger than current territory of Tiva. Saha even was larger, but they are not claiming any other territory, I assure you. Names matter. Once you have a republic, appetites for sovereignty grow. We've seen that comparative activism is enormously important. There's different kinds of activism with different kinds of issues. And demographics, of course, matter. Which areas have Russians absolutely poured into to create a neo-colonial kind of situation? Where have Russians been kind of pounded out? Thievens are now about four-fifths of their own population. Stanley, the, the last census is extraordinarily disputed still, and they're still not releasing statistics we've been waiting for for the portions. Saha are now over a half of their own territory, although authorities are not necessarily recognizing that. Buryats are only, at best, a third. And think of all the best and brightest leaving, both of Russians and non-Russians, who have been pouring out because of the war. Finally, there have been various kinds of looking backs, various kinds of nostalgias. They're not all looking to the Soviet period, as some people seem to think. Um, many of them are looking earlier, but they're picking and choosing what they have of their, their senses of self, what they want out of a state, whether they want to be oriented towards the West, and how they are going to decolonize. So I'll leave you with a white shaman on top of a sacred mountain overlooking Yakutsk, the importance of education of young people and of the ability of Siberians to have their own ways of educating in their own publics.